Hi, David Bizard here, and you are watching Power Attack 10. If you can give me about 20 minutes of your time, I will give you the experience of over 60 years of building high performance and race winning engines. So follow along here and hopefully you'll learn something that you possibly didn't know before. Since about 1975, I've dyno almost countless small block Chevys. A lot of them I've built. And one factor seems to have shown up as a steady, how shall I say, trend throughout all those builds. And that is that if you've got a 350, then you've got an engine which to make the best torque per cubic inch, not overall, of course it'll get more, because uh, what we're going to do is put a stroke of crank in. That 375 stroke of crank peps up a 350 more than just the increase in displacement. In other words, we make more horsepower. No, let me rephrase that. We have the ability with the stroke of crank to make more foot pounds per cubic inch. In other words, we put a stroke of crank in either a 3750 or a 3.875, and the increase in torque is bigger than the increase in capacity. Now that's all good stuff. And it's probably something you didn't know. And it's probably something a lot of engine builders have missed because they put the wrong cam in for that 383. Can't do this deal where it's, well, that, this cam worked great in R350, let's use it in R383. No, it doesn't work that way. That cam, if it was perfect for that 350, is not perfect for your 383. Right. So, the subject for today's video is the significance of 1.075 to 1.040. Right now, this number applies to anyone that's contemplating building a Stroker small block 350 Chevy. Why? Well, how many times have you pro heard, probably from magazine articles, and it's a very true statement that the success of an engine is basically getting the right combination. Well, part of the right combination with a small block Chevy is getting the best bore and stroke ratio. And that seems to hover around those two numbers I've just given you. Now, why is that so? Not too sure, but a, th a 383 small block Chevy will make more foot pounds per cube than the, your best 350. And I have a feeling that it's due to the fact that you can get a given compression ratio without having to have a, a bigger dome on the piston. So I think that its operational status is better combustion. Now, to back this up, I found that for a given compression ratio, and that's usually in the nine, eight and a half, nine to one, that a dish piston works very well. What we don't want then is having a big dome on the piston. I know that doesn't work because we've tried big dome pistons and actually lost over a hundred horsepower. Not good. Anyway, let's get on with the plot. Okay, a few pointers on building a stroker motor. And these will apply to any stroker motor, not just our 383, 396, and if you're brave, 408. Um, the first thing to do, well, let's get to the number one negative thing about stroker motors, and that is piston and ring to bore friction, right? The longer stroke is, all other things being equal, the more torque is used up turning the engine over. Now, 
it's whilst you're building the engine, it's best to select parts and a spec that minimizes the effect of that increased stroke. And it can be done. Most of you will be building motors which had either 5 64ths or 3 sixteenths, sorry, 5 64ths or 16th ring pack. Right, that'll be 5 64th, 5 64th and uh, 3 sixteenths, that's probably a quarter, right? Now, modern pistons have thinner rings. Uh, almost any piston you get now, the thinnest, the thickest ring it'll have for a Chevy is 16th, 16th, 3 16th set. Trust me, use a one millimeter, one millimeter, uh, two or three millimeter ring pack, right? Um, most of the popular companies have them. Marley has these pistons off the shelf with the rings with them. And you don't have to buy the ring separately. Um, so that's one source there. But there's others. You can get them from um, just about any of the popular piston manufacturers. So that's point one. Thinnest ring pack possible. The next thing doesn't seem very obvious, and that is stroker motors become a lot more efficient when the compression's up there. And for a street motor, and, and we're talking mostly street motors, the sweet spot is about 10 to 10.5 to 1. Now, if you're building a race motor and you're running on something other than 92 octane pump gas, then of course higher compressions work and the higher the better, right? If you're going to build a 383 or, or 396 stroker race motor, then you need to aim for absolute minimum of 14 to 1 and you'll get the benefits uh, of this. The reason why the compression ratio is significant here is that the side thrust on the piston doesn't become a problem until the piston is quite a ways down the bore. For where most of the power stroke occurs, the uh, side thrust on the piston and the rod angularity between a 5.7 rod and a 6 inch one is minuscule, doesn't make any difference. But if you have a high compression engine, most of the power, more of the power is developed in the first part of the stroke and less later on. In other words, it decays faster. So, with a high compression engine and, and a short rod, you have a situation where the deficit caused by the short rod occurs at a time when the pressure has dropped and therefore the side thrust has dropped. So you can offset the fact that the rod stroke ratio of your stroker is not quite what it may need to be because as compression goes up, rod length becomes less important. And as I said, 10.5, 10 to 10.5 is the sweet spot. Now the last major deal to take care of when you're building a stroker is to recognize the fact that the cam that worked in the smaller engine, if it was perfect, it's not going to be perfect for the bigger engine. And you could be throwing away that extra amount of torque that would otherwise be on your build agenda. Now, on average, a stroker will require, if we're, we're gonna increase the capacity like we are about 10 or 12 percent, um, we'll need a cam to, that's to be optimum, we'll need to be about one to two degrees on tighter lobe center line angle. Whatever cylinder heads you had, the build would respond better if the flow of those heads went up. But that doesn't necessarily mean a change in torque, it means a change in horsepower at the top end. So if you can get better heads, great. If not, just make sure you take care of that camshaft. Right. I'm going to pass you over to my uh, good friend, Mervyn Bonnet. Mervyn, crew chief, is a crew chief from down in the Caribbean, as well as a driver. And 
he is a, uh, a graduate of uh, Baltimore University at, for um, automotive engineering, right? Uh, and he's also the winningest crew chief and driver in the Caribbean. He also crews for some pretty uh, upmarket teams over here when he's in the States. Mervyn and I have been friends for coming up for 40 years now. And um, yeah, I knew him when he was, now he's, yep, because at the top of the picture. And uh, when I go racing in the Caribbean, Mervyn Cruz for me. But let me hand you over. He's going to give you a demonstration of how to install pistons on the rods and install them into a block. On a 396, he's doing for one of his buddies, right? So let me hand you over to Mervyn. Here he comes. Over the years, I have installed hundreds of rings piston rings using this exact method. Um, it takes a little while to really get the feel of how far you could move the ring before you damage it to get it over the piston. But if you're a newcomer to this, I recommend you use a piston ring expanding tool. Our piston pin are held in by this spiral lock you see here. The trick to installing these piston pin clips are to stretch them apart and they will come into the shape of a spring. Not too far so they lose their, their spring tension, just good enough where you can wind them in to the lock area of the piston. Now we're going to install the clip that holds the piston pin into the groove that's in the piston. First we locate the groove inside the piston. We place the end of the spring in the groove and we slowly turn the spring which will allow it to just rotate itself into the groove. When you get close to the end of the spring, you can assist yourself by using a screwdriver and slowly turn the spring into the groove. Screwdriver helps a lot at the end so you don't burst your fingertips. There we go. When it goes in, a good trick to do is take a screwdriver and make sure it fits perfectly in the groove all the way around. Little advice about piston ring installing tools. When you have thin rings as we do, please do not use this conventional ring tool. If the ring happens to slightly slip out the piston groove, this will grab it and destroy it. These are the ones I recommend. Tapered sleeve, tapered sleeves, piston installer tools. This is a 4.120. They come in ball sizes. You can purchase them from Goodson, from ARP, Total Seal, based on your ball size. Or there's an adjustable one as we have here where you can adjust and you can do multiple sizes in a specific range. Here I'm about to install number two piston on this small work Chevy and if the ring tool is correct, ring clearances are right, piston to wall clearances are correct, chamfer on the on the top of the bore of the piston cylinder is all correct, this is how you can do it. Just like so. So, what's the best I've seen from one of these Stroker 350s? Well, Terry Walters and I did one maybe four or five years ago that worked out very well. It was just a shade over the 10.5 to 1 compression, 
uh, it ran out of about 10.8. Still ran on pump gas okay, but it made 542 foot-pounds of torque and uh, totally streetable and it made about 585 horsepower. And um, uh, I need to point out, that's an output better than most 454 big blocks make. So there you go, big block power, small block weight. Now it looks like I've come to the end of this video, so don't let me forget to tell you to like, subscribe, share, etc. Hopefully I will see you in the near future. Thank you for watching.